Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, Michael Wilds with us. Um, this presentation is being recorded and posted uh, on our Instagram. Um, I would want to ask you to submit your questions by chat, mute yourself, and also uh, disable your video. We will take questions um, in the course of the presentation as well as in the end. Um, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for hosting me. Again, my name is Michael Wilds. It's my privilege to join these extraordinary DSOs um, who help you navigate these waters. Uh, for all of you students and parents of students, both that are here and prospectively thinking of coming to America, we are living through historic times. And don't kid yourself, our founding documents and parents, the founding um, parents of this nation, faced all sorts of challenges and, and surmounted them. And it's my privilege to help you. My name is Michael Wilds. I'm an immigration lawyer on 53rd and Madison. I'm a former federal prosecutor and a second generation immigration lawyer. My father started our law firm in 1960 before he and my mother, rest her soul, started me. All we practice is immigration law. I generally clean up a little nicer in a suit and tie, but when I work from home, I try to be a little more relaxed. And relax is the word that I'd like to get everybody a little comfortable with. We are going to discuss today the journey of coming to the United States. We'll talk about the new public charge rules, maintenance of your status, the president's new proclamation, and unemployment for those of you that are concerned. I want you to understand that we've been blessed to have the trust of hundreds of thousands of people through the last six decades, 60 years. I'm going to be turning 56 next year, but my father started this firm before he started me, as I indicated, and we've just about seen everything and anything under the sun. So sit back, take a deep breath. I know what you're going through. Not only do you have to surmount English, but get a visa. And then you get a visa and you come to the United States and you have to deal with these employers that are not treating you with the respect and the deference that you want. And then all of a sudden there's a pandemic. It's as if somebody took away the biblical straw in the Bible and told you to make more bricks now with less material. But guess what? Our metal as a world, not just as a nation, is being tested. And I believe we will step up into this role and we will step up into it fabulously. And it's my honor and privilege. I'm not paid to do these lectures and I'm happy to be available to you. And I'll talk a little bit about my practice and my availability at a later time. So let's kind of get started. What is US immigration law? Well, first, it's a system passed of laws by Congress and implemented uh, by um, our uh, nation um, as far as the movement of foreign nationals in and out. If you look at the first slide, you'll see, um, is there a way for me to see the slides? on this hello hi hi sorry so yeah i'm sharing the my screen you should yeah. be able to see it so I don't, I, i'm on not so, shared I'm, yet anya huh it's not shared yet it's not shared yet that's so strange okay sharing now okay so well i just want to make sure everybody has the same slide and um you'll just move as i say next slide Sounds good. Can you see my screen now? Yes, I can. It's perfect. Thank you. Fantastic. So I needed the, to visualize this for everybody. Um, am I still in the uh, slide also, or is it just uh, your photo and the screen? Uh, your video is in as well. Okay, good. So if you look down at the bottom, you'll see an arrow. And the arrow shows you the direction that people head. They come on the left with a B1, B2 visitor's visa. You may get an F1 student visa. You may then want to work in the workforce and get an H1B or an L. These visas are wonderful because they head in the direction of LPR, which is lawful permanent residence, a green card holder. And if you have a green card for three years, if you're married to a citizen, you can apply all the way to the right for US citizenship or five years if you're not married to a citizen. So all the way on the left are the weakest statuses. The B and the F are statuses that are not easy for you to surmount, 
and you have to always show consoles. And when you're making applications and you're coming back and forth from vacations, they can give you a hard time that you have to go back. The H-1B and the L, these are visas that allow you to be here for long strides and allow a dual intent to go forward. When we meet with clients, we're always trying to assess whether or not a person can find a path that would allow them to stay happily where they are and then go forward. The next slide shows you that there are two statuses that our country appreciates. They see people either as a non-immigrant or an immigrant. A non-immigrant is a person who's coming here temporarily to work, study, or visit, and an immigrant is a person who wants to live here uh, forever. Next slide. There is a presumption of immigrant intent in the law. By law, all persons applying for a visa or coming for an extension have to also show that they are not gonna be here permanently. So a young lady coming in with a marriage ring or a bride magazine or a hair covered in certain fates could end up being challenged because you say you're coming here to be a student, but I see you're married to an American citizen. You have a wedding coming up. They can actually go to task with you. There's no semblance of privacy in an airport. They can take your iPhone and they can go through it. The burden of proving that your non-immigrant intent, that you're gonna come here and go to an unrelinquished domicile, which is what you told the American consul when you got your F-1 visa, is really on you. And this presumption applies when you're filing for extensions or visa issuance abroad. The next, stat, the next slide are terms of art that you should be familiar with. People change status when they go from one temporary non-immigrant visa to another. They adjust status when you're going from a temporary status to a permanent status. It's like a big game of tag. You have to always make sure that you're on a base. You can't change your status unless you maintain the one you have and you could adjust status but it's a petition driven circumstance. You're not changing status or adjusting status without a petition. And a petition could be filed sometimes on your own to change your status or school or by an employer or certain family members. The next status, the next few slides I'm gonna run through uh, very quickly. This has a lot to do with the DSO's instructions, but I just wanna re-edify them to the extent that I can. An F1 student is supposed to be here full time. You're enrolled in a matriculated course of study that's academic at an educational institute approved by USAIS. You're allowed to stay here as long as the I-20. I don't have the benefit of sitting in a hall, but every one of you should have your I-20 on you, including the I-94 proof that you are in status and so forth. You may want to take pictures of that on your iPhone at the very least. You have to apply for and obtain an F-1 endorsement at a US embassy and you have to show that you have sufficient funds and maintaining a residence abroad and be here for the duration of the entry that you're allowed. You're allowed to be here for 60 day grace period after the expiration of the I-20 or your work authorization card. The next slide has to do with the principle of maintenance of your status. In order to maintain your status, you're required to maintain your full-time enrollment and ensure that your passport and I-20 are on you at all time and that you're in touch with the student affairs office and so forth. It is a ground of removal if you don't have your documents uh, with you. The next slide talks about violating your status. If you don't maintain a full-time enrollment, if you engage in any unauthorized employment, or you fail to request authorization from withdrawing from class, you transfer to a new school without following uh, proper procedures, you fail to enroll by a date specified, um, or changing programs, it's a problem. And again, any criminal activity may jeopardize your right to remain in the United States. The next slide talks about travel abroad. If you plan on traveling, you need to make sure that the DSO signature is only valid for six months, that it's fresh on your I-20, that you have a current signature on that. You should visit the DSO with your passport and make sure that your passport is valid for at least six months from the time you go. The next slide is actually a checklist that's useful for you and you're welcome to keep a copy of this um, PowerPoint or email me. My email is Michael at Wilds Law. You see in the bottom of the of the uh, page. Uh, so it's my name, A-E-L, Michael at WildsLaw.com. So if you're traveling abroad as a student, you want to have a valid passport, a valid visa stamp, immigration document, either the 2019 if you're a J student or an I-20 if you're an F-1. You have to valid have a valid travel signature that's been endorsed within uh, the last six months. 
and you are required to carry the original documents. A brief word on the next slide on driver's license. You can apply for a driver's license or you can uh, get a, a, a driver's ID. The following slide has to do with income tax. All international students are required to file tax returns. It's easy. If you haven't done it in the past, you should go forward and make sure you do it. You want to be in compliance. Employment authorization documents is the next slide. There are two kinds of employment authorization. There's one that's called CPT, which is curricular practical training. That's why you're in school. It's, it's authorized by the DSO and it's placed on tier I-20. It could be obtained only after one full year of schooling and it's limited to 20 hours a week when school is in session and 40 hours when it's on holiday and breaks. If a student completes one full year of CPT, the student is ineligible for OPT. Therefore, you want to keep your CPT down to one year. This is all predicated on economic necessity, which is basically a change of circumstances. They want you to be able to maintain yourself and pay your tuition without such a consequence. The next slide talks about OPT, which is practical uh, training generally good for a year. It's initiated by requesting the DSO, again, to rec recommend it within 90 days of completing your courses. Now, you have to make sure that you are in cadence with all the workshops that this wonderful school and your DSO is particularly very special and very talented. Make sure that you are, again, on top of this. If you don't, you lose it. If you lose it, you can't use it. And that's a problem. Now. OPT is not tied to a particular employer, but it is tied to your field of study. So if you're studying acting, are you allowed to be a waiter in a restaurant? It's cute, but you could say that you're studying people and experience and the mannerisms and the way people exchange pleasantries and the way a mother talks to a father and a father-in-law talks to a son-in-law. So it is again tied to a course of study and it could be construed generally for those of you that are thinking of starting your own company and getting a tax id number and using the opt as if you're a fifth avenue uh, retailer be very careful because the day after your opt expires you don't have the right to work for the company that you're now tied to and it can be a you know it could be something that can choke you you have to get a work authorization which an ead is an employment authorization document from usas prior to commencement of the employment and you're allowed to get an opt for each ascending degree after a BA, after a master's or a PhD, it's actually a great way to pivot. There are some reporting requirements on maintenance of your status. All students are required to report to the DSO within 10 days of any change of your name, your residential address, name, address, and so forth. Also, you're not allowed to accrue any aggregate of more than 90 days of unemployment during the OPT time. You have to be aware. OPT means you have to work. Now, you don't have to be paid to work. So actually, it could work out fabulously for you. If you don't find a job, volunteer for a charity. The next rules are for STEM students. Are there STEM students in this session, if I may ask? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Good. So, yes. good. So I'll just briefly run through this. Students holding degrees in science, technology, engineering, and maths can extend for an additional 24 months for a total of three months. They effectively get three shots at this coveted H-1B visa. You get three OPTs, and we have examples on the slide as to what is a STEM student. The next slide talks about your requirements. You have to be currently participating in a 12-month period of OPT with a U.S. employer directly related to STEM. You have to have completed at least a bachelor's, master's, or a doctoral degree, and the employer must be registered and participating in E-Verify for you to qualify. You also want to get a social security number. You'll need this not only when you're a student, but you'll need this later in your employment life. And I just want you to understand fundamentally, my job is to enable you and to give you your voice and the confidence so that you feel that you can onboard into the workforce. Despite the tide of this president and the administration, despite the hardship of the law and the financial not, you know, wherewithal that you need, and now a pandemic on top of it. I have to tell you, it's an extraordinary experience. I'm also a mayor, by the way, in New Jersey where I live. And in the middle of a pandemic a week ago, we ended up with a power outage. I don't know what else was gonna happen. 
Thank God I walked away that week. I was healthy and I was alive. And that's what you have to do. I don't care if you pray on a Friday, a Saturday, or a Sunday. You have your health. You have a vision of what you want to be. Find somebody like me who will get you there. And you'll get there. Just be smart about decisions that you take. Social security is important because you want to have that ID. And a lot of businesses will need it ultimately. I'm going to jump to a very murky uh, topic, and that's called cap gap. This, this is for a student who has an OPT. The OPT is about to expire, and now you want to apply for the H-1B visa. There's a little bit of a gap sometimes in the way the work card uh, works out. And the basic rule is if you filed for the H-1B um, and your OPT expires more than six days prior to the filing or afterwards, it's a pivotal time. I'm not going to get into it very heavy right now. That's a conversation. You should always feel free to text, email, and I'll give you all my cell phone when we hang up. The next page is critical, the public charge rules. And these are rules that have a lot to do with you as young students becoming either a public charge because you came here with a certain amount of money from mom and dad, or you earned a certain amount of money, or you had scholarships, and then all of a sudden you became um, financially a challenge. A public charge means that you're likely to receive one or more defined public benefits for more than 12 months in the aggregate with any 36 month period. It applies for anybody who's coming to the United States who wants to eventually get a green card by adjusting their status. Again, the adjustment is when you change from a temporary to a green card. And aliens who seek to extend their stay or, or change their status. So the government can give you a hard time when you're changing status or extending your status or you're trying to get a green card. They will look at the totality of circumstances taking into account your age, your health, your family status, education, skills, assets, and financial status. They'll look at your shoes if you're coming in in an airport to see how fancy, and if you look like you have what it is to be sincere and the ability behind you as far as the content in your family and in your bank account to support you. They'll consider whether the applicant has private health insurance or sufficient resources to cover the reasonably foreseeable costs related to a medical condition and consider any financial liabilities. If you owe the entire world and you don't have a sugar daddy or somebody in your family or home that's willing to help you, you're gonna have a problem and you may see this coming and you may wanna get uh, some advice. The public benefits also include all sorts of benefits, cash assistance, SNAP, Section 8 housing and vouchers. Be very careful before you take any of it that you ask whether or not it's gonna have a consequence. There was a new act called the CARES Act, uh, which the next slide talks about, which has to do with stimulus payments and unemployment benefits. When COVID-19 struck about a month ago, we in the field were very concerned. A lot of people lost their jobs and a lot of people, now employers, started to take money and they started to offer to furlough their employees. And employees who've come on specific visas now had to figure out are they allowed to take um, insurance? Can they take unemployment insurance? Now, the, the bottom line is, if you have a visa allowing you to work for company A and you lose your job, to get unemployment insurance, you have to say that you're willing to work for anybody else. That's a state law. But an alien, a person who hears from another country, cannot, I hate to use the word alien, that's just the way it's described in the law. I teach in a law school and I try to come up with all sorts of versions, but it's the legal term. So an alien has to describe to the authorities that they're willing to take another job, but they can't without a visa. Don't worry. It does not implicate a public charge rule if you take unemployment insurance. For now, it's been settled. The CARES Act provides for economic impact payments and unemployment benefits, which include green cards and certain individuals in non-immigrant status. The IRS considers these economic impact payments to be tax credits and therefore excluded from the public charge consideration. Our president is gonna to try to scare you. Do not be scared. USCIS policy manual specifically excludes quote unquote unemployment benefits, end quote, from the public charge determination. Generally speaking, most states require applicants to be immediately available and available for work in any suitable full-time employment opportunity because most work visas are only authorized to work for the specific petitioning employer Typically, they are unable to meet these requirements, but they're permitted to take the benefits, and it's not an issue. This could change, so this is not the gospel. 
All right, if there are any questions on this CARES Act, I'll entertain them at a later time. Let's talk about some of the major visas. I've now talked about everything that you know, and you're all expert immigration lawyers. I just want you to understand in the old days when my dad did these lectures, people had no problems. There was no cap on H-1B visas. So they came to America. They went to school for four years. They got an OPT for one year. You applied for an H-1B because you knew you were going to get it. You had six years. And then they were apply for a green card. They get it within a year. So you can effectively be here for 10 years plus and not have to worry and everything worked out. And that's decades worth of work. Things are changing now. You're all gonna be experts. Not only do you have to look for the job, you have to be able to communicate, you have to become an immigration lawyer and you have to know when not to waste time with employers. I'm gonna go over some of the highlighted visas. And if you wanna do a deep dive in any one of these, I'm happy to make uh, time for you in my office and I'll explain that at a later time. These are the main visas, the B-1, B-2, the E-3, the H-1B, the I-J-L-O-R. They literally go from A to V, and I'm gonna hit some of the more uh, interesting ones. The B visas, B-1 is for visitor for pleasure. B-2, excuse me, B-1 is for business. B-2 is for pleasure. Most people have a B-1, B-2 visa in their passport. Some people have B-1, some people have B-2. You're allowed to come here for business or for pleasure if you want but you have to, there's a fine line between business and employment. There's a fine line between a person who's coming to go to Disney World and a person who you know, enjoys their instrument or their creative work. Just because you love playing the tuba doesn't mean you could walk into an airport and say you're volunteering at a concert. We represent Lincoln Center and a lot of distinguished groups in New York. You have to be very careful. You are, even if you're not being paid, breaking your immigration status in the United States, and it could be a breach. The B-1, B-2 visa is also the pivot visa. You may want to change your status from an F-1 or for something else and become a visitor if you need to. Um, that's a way to kind of buy time. You can be here for months until they get to it, and then you can pivot to another visa. So it's a wonderful visa. The next slide talks about the visa waiver program, very different than the B-1, B-2. There are about 38 countries that we have status, we have a program where nationals visiting the United States, where there's low rate of immigrant uh, immigration, are allowed to come up to 90 days. An American like myself can go to France for 90 days, no questions asked. We allow them to come here. It's called the ESTA visa waiver program. The next slide gives you a list of those countries. Be very careful because they may admit you in that status. And if they admit you in that status by accident, you're no longer an F1 and you've lost your status. Um, and that could be a problem. So now, um, the next slide, we're going to start getting into some of the meat and potato visas, the H-1B visa. This will put you to sleep, I apologize. There's nothing to say, there's nothing exciting about this visa. This is a visa for a person with a bachelor's degree and a pulse, that's it. If you have at least a degree and you're alive and your degree relates to a field in a business, you're allowed to get an H-1B. It's got to be at least a bachelor's degree, and it's got to be, or the equivalent of a bachelor's degree. We're allowed to take three years of experience for every one year of school that you're missing. So if you're coming to a school and you have a two-year uh, diploma, you can take six years of work experience in your home country and equivocate it. Or if you had three years of schooling, but you're itching to get into the workforce, we can look at the constellation of experience that you have. The petitioning U.S. employer must offer you a prevailing wage. Now, when you're leaving school, you have a one-year OPT, that allows you to work for anybody and you get minimum wage. This is why employers don't love this. I'm sorry that I can't interact with you and draw you out in real time, but I want you to understand, U.S. employers have to offer you a prevailing wage. So if you're right out of the new school and they give you a job for 15, 20, 25 dollars an hour, now, all of a sudden, the prevailing wage says it's $56.92 per hour. They don't want to pay it. The position also has to be directly related to the foreign nationals field of study. You can't have a degree uh, in creative writing, and then you're working as a financial analyst. They got to connect. Um, and also, by the way, it can be done as the next slide uh, will be to show you in the next few slides. It could be part-time. 
So that's one of the ways that you can get around this. If the person doesn't want to pay you the full salary, they can pay you part-time. But you can't be working full-time. You have to be working part-time hours. So H-1B, you're allowed to stay up to six years. It's an awesome visa. And you're allowed to get one-year increments. I don't know if you can see me. Can they see me? Yeah, they can see you. Okay, I lost the slides. But, you know, I'm going to keep saying lost, uh, next slides and all that, but then I can at least see, my, see myself in the other slide. So if you have a um, H-1B, it's up to six years. If by year five, your green card is cooking for a full year, you can extend your H-1B all the way till 10, um, to whatever years that you need to. So you get one year incremental extensions until your green card's done. You can even get three year extensions at a certain stage. The next slide talks about the annual cap of 65,000 visas. The H-1B only has 65,000 visas. There's an additional 20,000 for people who have a master's level education. They are set aside out of the 65,000, 5,200 are for Chile or Singaporeans, it's 2,600 each and, uh, and so forth. There are also some employers that are exempt from the H-1B cap, institutions of higher education. So if um, a university is gonna offer you a job, they don't have to apply for the H-1B uh, during a certain season. The rule of thumb, by the way, is that you can apply for visas six months in advance. The H-1B is only available every year in October, which means six months before that, you can apply for it in April. Today is April 27, it's actually my wife's birthday. That means 27 days ago, the expiration of your eligibility to apply for H-1s evaporated. That means anybody who wants to do an H-1 for next year, unless you're going to a nonprofit organization affiliated with a higher school or government research organization or an institution of higher education, you have to make sure that you apply in this cadence. So again, to summarize, there are 65,000 H-1Bs. There's an additional 20,000 if you have a master's from the U.S. You have to apply in April for an October start date. Um, this last year, over 200,000 people applied for the visa. So it's about a one in three chance of going forward and the wage has to be um, uh, prevailing. The next slide talks about the portability of the uh, H-1B. It enables employers um, to look and recruit if they want to from people who have H-1Bs. You can imagine employers are now saying, I don't wanna go through this lottery. What if I spend all this money and I don't get it? By the way, the employer is required to pay for the filing fee. You generally can have a lawyer represent you. So very critically, a lot of people don't want to do H-1Bs because there's no assurance that they're gonna get you. And they're actually looking for people in the market that already have H-1Bs because the portability clause allows those people to pivot into your workforce. By the way, you're allowed to have multiples sometimes of some of the same visas. You're not allowed to have two at the same time that are different. What does that mean? You could have two full-time jobs. You could have two H-1Bs. You could have a full-time and a part-time job, or you could have two part-time jobs. I'm a full-time immigration lawyer. I'm also a full-time mayor. I have two full-time jobs. If I needed a visa, I could have two separate H-1Bs. The beauty of the H-1B, it allows for a dual intent. That means a person can immediately apply for a green card. So if you're gonna get married, if you have a company that loves you, I don't want them applying for a green card when you're a student, when I can pivot you into an H1, because that dual intent sets you up in a right way to insulate you. Also, the next slide talks about terminations. There is a 60-day grace period now applying to which an individual must either find a new employer or apply to change status or depart the United States. Changing status to a B2 is also an option. That's that pivot visa. Just keep in mind the employer is responsible to return transportation to your home country. I don't know if there are any Canadians watching this, but there are special visas for certain countries. Yep. Canada is one of them. It's kind of like we're attached to one another. Um, TN visas are for Canadians and for Mexicans. It's limited to specific jobs that are there. It's a wonderful visa to go to when you have your degree and you're Canadian, but if it's not on the list, don't try to make it fit and don't try to make things up. The government's gonna make sure that you have the right educational credentials and your initial admission generally is for three years, but it's not like the H-1B where there's a dual intent. You can change to an H-1 if you want to, but it, you, know, you have to be careful. Now, there is a disparity in the way Canadians and others are handled. Canadian nationals do not need a visa and may make an application at the border. 
Mexican nationals require a visa. So you can't do it in an airport. You have to go to an American consulate or embassy in Canada. You can process it at a border. Again, there's no statutory limit, but if you keep getting TNs for the rest of your professional life, at some point they can dun you for having a dual intent. The next status, the next slide, also has to do with the Australian nationals. For those of you that are watching it, we have a special E3. And E3 is like an H1B. It's a person with a bachelor's degree and a pulse who's Australian. They talk a little funny, but the bottom line is the quotas have always been open for those. That's another pivot visa. It's, it's granted generally for three years and there's no statutory limitation, but they could create a problem. The L1 intercompany transfer is the next visa. This is the uh, visa for people who work overseas. I've counseled a lot of my clients based on the relationships and the experiences they have that they can on occasion, if they need to, go abroad, work for a company with an office that has an affiliate or a subsidiary in the United States and transfer back. Sometimes it's easier to do that. Retreat, work someplace. You're not deemed to be a threat to the American job market when you're doing a lateral move back into America. You, you have to at least work one year within the last three years abroad. And the government will know every day, week, and month that you came in on a B1, B2, or otherwise. So you have to make sure it's 365 days boots on the ground. You can be an executive or a manager and get an L1A, or if you have some proprietary knowledge of the company board, you can get an L1B. The L1As get it for seven years. The L1B gets it for five years. The L1As have a fast track for a green card. The L1Bs have to go through the labor department. The next visa is known as the artist visa, the Einstein visa. I got a lot of flack, but I actually am uh, the immigration lawyer for the first lady, Mrs. Trump. I handled the president's immigration work for many years when he owned Trump Models, Miss Universe, and we handle a lot of work. I should tell you, I'm a very proud Democrat. And if you go Google and YouTube, you'll see that despite my professional relationship and personal friendship with Mrs. Trump, I've stood up to the president as a measure of politics and as a gentleman uh, where I felt that he's gone off uh, the wires on immigration. Um, it's my prayer because I know that he looks for talent, that he will come around um, eventually and help understand that the healing of this nation will come out of uh, the beautiful help in the arts, culture, and entertainment uh, right now, which is being curtailed. And mind you, the science and technology that undermine, underpins just about every area needs um, talent. And this O visa that we're about to embark on talks about aliens of extraordinary ability. These are people in the arts, science, business, education, or athletics who have achieved national or international acclaim. You cannot be a legend in your own mind. You have to be somebody empirically important. And the fact that you're coming straight out of school is a problem not a death nail. We've gotten a lot of F1s and OPTs, O visas, but generally it's in their rear view mirror. They had a lot of experience before they got here. If you have some major awards and experience that you got during your OPT, the government may challenge you. Now we do work for the School of Fine Arts. There are a lot of very talented students. Justin Bieber had an O visa when he was 12. We've done scores of these visas for a lot of talent the world over, and there is no age but there is a good sense of propriety that we have. Sometimes we don't have our F1s change status, so they remind the government that they're students, but we have them leave. Canadians don't need visas for the most part, so it's not an issue if they have to leave. Generally, an old visa requires an advisory opinion from a peer group describing your ability, your talent, and the nature of the work that you have. The requirements, if you go to the next slide, talk about, the, the, I'm sorry? Yeah, we're there, good. Um, the O-1 requirements talk about individuals in the arts, business, or science. Generally, you have to prove that you have commitments in the United States, that you these kind of upcoming work commitments is a problem now in the middle of COVID-19. How do people say that I'm going to be doing work in this gallery or for this graphic designer or in this uh, space in the fashion business when the business is closed and they're working from home? It's a real problem. And it's particularly an issue, and we can get around that issue by doing an agent-based O, where we have you get multiple deal memos from several employers, and then we present an agent that goes to immigration. That multiple job offer shows that you have the ability to freelance, like a visual artist, a musician, an actor, or graphic designers, 
Because let's face it, if it's a film, it's a few months. If it's a commitment from a, to curate something in a museum, it may be a show or two or a gallery. But if you really want to have a narrative, because it's just a form on a box, any lawyer that charges you for three years more than one year is taking advantage of you. And if you want to be able to work for multiple employers, you want to have an agent so that if you lose your job, the person who brought you to the dance doesn't control whether or not you have to go home. You might find somebody else if we craft the visa properly. So there's a lot in how you do the visa. The old one must prove that you have won major awards or you must demonstrate you have at least three out of the following standards. And we do a, a robust assessments in our office. I generally charge a consultation fee. During that consultation, if I know it's an O, I do it and I go forward. If I'm not sure, I might charge somebody a smaller fee to do a deep dive and look at their press, their awards, the conferences, the exhibits, the tear sheets, magazines, evidence of their compensation and support letters. And we want to see, do you have strong people in the industry writing things about you? Do we have good Wikipedia pages and the people that are going to write? Are they writing about you because of something you did or are you part of a team of people that did something or you worked in a company and where's your fingerprint on this? This is critical. And then we come back to somebody who say, look, out of the six or the eight, we think you have two. We think you have three. We think that they're all weak and we think they're strong and we can go forward. The next slide talks about timing. We do cases very quickly and on a rush basis depending on the timeline. Once it's filed, it can take four months to be approved. Right now, there's no premium processing. So unfortunately, for about 1400 bucks, you could, uh, I have to update the, uh, the PowerPoint here, um, you could expedite it, but it's been pulled because of COVID-19. You then have to get a visa at the consulate or embassy abroad, and your old petition, once it's approved, you have to schedule that, and they can deny you there. So we prepare our clients, some of our clients, um, do not need or want to travel and they have all kinds of issues or if you had some kind of criminality or challenge you have to be very careful as well. The next slide talks about the O2. These are for visas for the supporting artists. So if you are a, we did work for Evgeny Kissin, a beautiful talented pianist. Um, his mother was his wardrobe stylist. She was the O2. Those are given to in individuals who provide essential support but it only works in the creative. You can't bring an O2 for somebody in the business space. You have to show that the person has prior work experience and they possess unique essential skills that are not readily available. Sometimes it's easier for you coming out of school to get an O2 and hook your wagon to somebody else's O1, develop your own stride and then branch off on your own O1. If you marry an O1, you can get an O3, which is the next slide for dependents, spouses and minor children up to 21, uh, can get an O3 uh, as well. The next visa is the J visa. Most of you are prohibited from getting it once you're an F1. You can't be a perpetual student or internship. J1s are for trainees and for interns. It's for like the au pairs for medical students, summer work and so forth like that. The next slide talks about, you can see the mean face. We don't want you violating your status. If you remain in the United States beyond your expiration of your authorized stay, you can develop unlawful presence. What does that mean? If you overstay a visa for 180 days, not six months, 180 calendar days, this year with February 29 was a leap year. If you're here for 180 days beyond your visa, you have a three year bar. If you're here more than 365 days, you have a one, you have overstayed for more than a year, you're facing a 10 year bar. And that is a serious problem in this country and can only be overcome if you marry an American citizen, you file the case after legal entry and the government hasn't found you. The I-94 um, is dated DS. Even if the foreign national failed to maintain a status, you may nevertheless obtain an immigrant visa through processing an American consulate. This is under controversy right now and you can't do it. The DS does not uh, protect you. Obtaining permanent residency, once you have one of these temporary visas, a lot of you would like to apply for visas. And this has been the journey, ladies and gentlemen. People come to America on a temporary visa or they go to school, they look for a work visa, eventually they wanna get a green card and eventually they wanna get citizenship. And that's what happens. You get a green card through a family preference, through a petition from an employer, 
or making a major investment, you can literally buy a green card. You can apply through asylum, refugee, battered spouse, or otherwise. The next slide is an important slide, and that brings us to the president's proclamation suspending entry to immigrants. It wasn't as serious as people thought because all of the embassies have been closed anyway. The president basically said for the next 60 days, he's suspending anybody from the United States uh, it, from coming to the United States um, if they have an employment-based green card abroad. Permanent residents are granted open market employment work authorization. Therefore, the entry into the United States will be suspended for those people. This has no impact on an H-1B, on an O-1, or an OPT. This is all yet to be um, discussed because the president said he's going to look at this in the next 30 days. And we expect that he'll look at the non-immigrant next. So we may have to do another session or an update to the session uh, if something changes. So first, it doesn't apply to anyone present in the United States on April 23 already, possessing an immigrant visa or certain immigrant categories. So if you have an EB-5, for example, you bought a green card based on employment, um, you've invested a half a million or a million dollars, they're not touching you. If you have a marriage-based petition going on, they're not touching you or any other exemptions that qualifies. Um, this um, proclamation is due to expire uh, 60 days from April 23rd, but may be extended depending on how things are going. And within 30 days of the effective date, the Pre Secretary of Labor and Homeland Security are going to review the non-immigrant programs and recommend other measures about prioritizing hiring and employment in the United States. And it seems that non-immigrants, H-1B, E-3s, and all of that could be the next possible targets. Again, my assessment is this is not as harsh as what it could have been. The president is trying to get reelected also. He's trying to help Americans get employment and jobs. But little do you realize you need immigrants not only to do all the jobs that underlie every market. If you look at the hospitality corridor, the hotels are closed now in major cities. But when they open, who's going to make the beds? Who's going to pick the blueberries? who, by the way, are inventing all of the top of the fold Wall Street Journal patents for the last generation other than foreign workers. Even Bill Gates went and testified on Capitol Hill in support of that. We are shooting ourselves in the foot, ladies and gentlemen, if we don't help onboard you, foreign students, the creme de la creme of our country into the workforce. What are we gonna do, make it hard for you? So who won? You'll forgive me. The new school made tuition on you, now you have to leave? And American workers are gonna compete against you as you make your home in India and Sweden and everybody else wonderful? It's foolish, it's politics, ignore it. Just look at it as reality TV gone bad and stay with blinders on message. Get yourself a good lawyer, stay on track. Do not get deterred by this. This whole proclamation I think is politically driven because it doesn't have the teeth. It's not gonna get Americans jobs, if anything. American employers who are hiring guys like me need foreign talent to make sure that they can have the underbelly of their company survive. You know why? Because eventually you guys are going to get visas. You're going to get a green card. You're going to become a citizen. You're going to sponsor other people. And that's basically what we did in this country. It kind of regenerates itself as every single team, every single nation starts to recycle itself and talks about that golden experiment. So somebody comes here temporarily and eventually they become a citizen and they bring the next generation in. That's what America has distinguished itself through the years. Do not lose sight of that. There's a travel ban. The next slide talks about travel ban 4.0. Why 4.0? Because this has been bantered about in the courts for so long. There's no immigrant visa to Burma, Eritrea, Kyrgyzstan, Nigeria, ex except with limited exception if there's a waiver granted and we're working on waivers like that. There's no diversity visa to Sudan and Tanzania. There's no non-immigrant visa restriction for the newly identified countries. It only applies if you're outside on February 21, 2020, and you don't have a valid visa. If you're in the United States in February 21, it doesn't apply to you. So those countries on top have travel bans and waivers can be granted if you can prove an undue hardship to a foreign national or entry wouldn't pose a threat and entry would be in the national interest and we are working heavily in this area. So you get a green card. The next slide talks about employment with the sponsor. The application presumes that you're gonna be there. 
but there's no slavery. So one day when you get the job, you get it, you enjoy your green card, you can be fired or you can quit. There's no statutory time limit for how long you have to be there, but you really want to work in good faith and maintain your status as best as you can. These are the ways of getting green cards. The EB-1 is the first preference. These are aliens of extraordinary ability. We, we try to get you an O visa first so the government thinks that you're outstanding and then we pitch the EB-1 if we think we can succeed. Here, rather than three out of six to three out of eight, you have to hit three out of 10. And even if you hit three strong out of the 10 standards that there are, there's a Kazarian standard. And I teach this across the street from the new school, the Cardozo Law School, and you're welcome to come to that class. You have to show in the totality of the circumstances, you are shoulders apart other people. So even if you hit three out of 10, the government's not gonna care if there are 100 of you throughout the world. You have to show that you're one of a few. EB1s are also the L1 visas, the multinational transfers that we talked about, those people who can apply for green cards after they have an L1, and people who are uh, extraordinary can also self-sponsor. So that's the EB1. There are uh, five preferences of getting green cards. EB1 are the, uh, the fast track uh, managers and executives, and they're aliens of extraordinary ability. EB2 and EB3 are labor department cases through the Labor Department, we have to run ads. There are also people who can show that they're doing something in the national interest or they have advanced degrees. The next slide talks about EB3, which is the third preference. These are skilled workers, people with bachelor's degrees, where you have to run ads in the newspaper and an employer has to go through a conventional case of looking for Americans first to see if there's a shortage. And then once the Labor Department certifies it, you're actually able then to go to immigration and get a green card. The fourth preference are special immigrants for religious workers, abused um, spouses, and former UN employees. And the fifth preference are investors who are making investments in the United States. The numbers have gone up since the slide uh, that I gave you. Um, the PERM uh, is not a haircut. That's the labor certification process. That's the EB2 and three, where you're running those ads uh, and so forth. The, Next slide is US citizenship. You have a visa, you got yourself a green card. Now, if you're married to a US citizen, three years later, you can apply for citizenship or five years if you got it based on employment. This is the golden grail. You get citizenship if you're either born in America, you acquire it out of the United States by birth, if one or both of your parents were citizens. Um, you can derive it through the naturalization of your parents or you can apply for naturalization after three, if you're married to a citizen, or five, if you got it through employment. You want to become a citizen because, God forbid, you're ever accused of any criminality, you can be deported. You have the right to vote. You have the right to participate in federal programs, getting a passport, and qualify for security clearances and insulation, 100% of insulation from deportation. The final slide is just a word on our practice, if I may. Um, we have uh, been around since 1960. Um, I'm located on uh, 53rd and Madison in Manhattan, uh, in Englewood, New Jersey, and in Aventura, Miami. By appointment only, I see people in Los Angeles when I'm out there as well. All we do is immigration. We have five units in our office. Uh, we have a robust business immigration group. I chair that practice um, in, uh, by, and I teach that in, um, in, our, uh, in, in Cardozo Law School. It's business immigration law, dealing with all the visas. The, it's the acronym HELLO, the H, the E, the L, the O. And we're representing a lot of companies from basketball teams to banks to cheese companies to, to hedge funds that are bringing people over to the United States. The business visas also for spouses and dependents and we deal with the employer and their ethical considerations. If you represent the company, you represent the individual and you have to be well versed in dealing with that. We also have a robust personal group in our office, the family division. That's chaired by somebody very talented who's been with us for more than 30 years. And that team works on the personal side of the ledger. You found love, you wanna marry, you now wanna pivot into the system, mind you, you have to be super sensitive that the two green cards that give you a green card after a short time, a marriage case, and an EB-5, both of those have conditional green cards. If you invest a million dollars in a company, it's actually $900,000 into a U.S. company, you can get a green card. 
you're only going to get a green card good for two years. If you're here on an F1 visa and you decide to marry your boyfriend or girlfriend, you're only going to get a green card good for two years if the marriage is less than two years. They don't trust these projects, whether you're investing in them, and they don't trust marriages. They will want a second bite at the apple. In fact, we're seeing all kinds of things through the years. And I have to tell you, um, I have to be careful because ethically, I can't tell you because we have a great record that I would never lose a case. But my father, if he was sitting with me, and thank God he's well, we've never lost a marriage case in the 60 plus years that we're, we're practicing. Now, a lot of the marriages have fallen apart, but marriage cases have a lot to do with getting the content of the credentials and the bona fides of the marriage and showing it to the authorities. And those cases are so important to succeed because we do our own vetting in our office. We won't take a phony marriage, nor should you do it because you'll go to jail. And the conditional green card has to be overcome. But the personal side of the ledger sometimes works well and we have clients that come in I want to know a husband and a wife, a boyfriend and a boyfriend, a girlfriend and a girlfriend. I want to know whether or not there's some advantage for one for the other. Because sometimes we have a visa that keeps both people here and both working. And then we do a green card through somebody that they had no idea when they come in because I found something or my office found something. So it's business visas. It's personal visas. We have a robust litigation group. People are placed in removal proceedings or in federal court and it's very strong. The litigation group is somebody's always looking at the criminality and the challenges that people have if you misrepresent yourself when you're coming into the United States or otherwise. We also have a robust compliance unit, the I-9, the document that you have to fill out when you're going into a company. Those I-9 documents are critical because they have a lot to do with the onboarding into the workforce. In the same spirit of what it is that you're doing, employers have to deal professionally with you and there's the office of special counsel set up to make sure that the onboarding is proper. Did they ask you any untoward information? Did they ask you in a respectful way and so forth? And finally, we have a robust um, consulate practice where we're dealing with American embassies uh, the nation over. American embassy and consular work is a big part of our practice. We charge project uh, based fees, never hourly. And the reason that we charge a uh, project-based fee and never hourly is because we know that this is not a file. This is your life. We're trying to make sure that we get this right and that you have the ability to remain in the United States uh, as long and as, as you want to. And that means having more conversations. So any immigration lawyer that's charging you by the hour is probably taking advantage of you unless they stay within a certain ballpark and we know what those fees are. Most of our uh, staff speak multiple languages, are available all the time, and I team people up with a partner, a lawyer, uh, and support. Sometimes you'll have two lawyers, sometimes you'll have two paralegals, but there's always a partner looking over everyone's shoulders. We're always updating our clients, and yes, we do have prompt and efficient service despite being in the middle of the COVID-19, we are actively taking in new matters and filing, thank God, lots of love and marriages. I'm a mayor in New Jersey and I'm actually filing marriage cases the world over um, and, and marrying people. I'm not even charging for the marriages because I want to remind the people I represent that love is abound and that this too uh, will actually pass. I charge a consultation fee uh, to meet with people. My fee is $650. Uh, other people's fee in my office is 500. We never see people with that in the consultation fee. But I always can credit the consultation fee to the case unless you don't hire us right away or there's a nuance in the case. And I have a special arrangement with the new school where I offer a lower consultation fees and so forth. Um, that's basically uh, my presentation. I, I just want to tell you that you're part of an extraordinary tradition and the tradition here is coming to the United States at a time and in a way that is not orthodox. And these are historical times. This country was built on the backs of immigrants and it will be on the backs of immigrants that we will get ourselves out of this PTSD that we're invariably going to face and businesses will reconstitute themselves. Americans are going to rely on you 
and one day you'll become an American, and then you'll look over your rearview mirror, remembering the experience you had now, and you'll be helping your children and the future of this nation later. Get on board, and we're here to help you. Thank you so much, Michael. We have um, a lot of questions. Okay. So I'm going to go through questions, and I, some of them are the same, the same type of questions, and read them out to you, okay? So, Anya, do you mind if I do that? I've been tracking them. Sure, yeah. And, um... Give me one second, guys. Give me one second, please. Sure. And I would just want to remind you that this session is recorded, and I will post it on Instagram shortly um, after this webinar so you can follow us on ISS New, ISSS New School um, and the video will be there. I will also uh, tag uh, Michael Wilds in the Instagram uh, post so you can get his contact information um, and contact him for services if you need it. Uh, and if I missed anything or if I went fast it's because um, I have a lot of moving parts and police and fire radios and children downstairs and I want to make sure that I am the perfect husband and my wife's birthday, but I will make time for you and the fact that you listen to this makes my job easier and then I can lower the consultation fee. I'll come up with something that's uh, favorable to the community. Thank you, Michael. So we have lots and lots of questions. Um, I was answering a few of them during the chat, but they became quite extensive. So there's a lot of them. Um, for you students, we'll try to get to as many as possible um, because there's so many of them. I'm not sure we can get to all of them, but we'll try. I'll do another uh, session, no big deal. There we go. So uh, I'm gonna start with this one and I think I will answer it, but I'll just start with it. It says, so if I studied fashion design and want to start a, a job in a fashion magazine as a journalist, I took journalism classes during my courses of study and my degree is journalism, not from the US college. So does my OPT apply only to fashion designer positions or general to fashion design field? So the answer to that question is yes. So because your major in what you studied in the US, when you apply for OPT, you are applying based on that major, not something that you may have studied outside of the US. That's right. It's a field of study. So if, if, if you are studying in the world of fashion, then you can construe that broadly. There is no policing of your OPT. But later on, when the government starts looking at your resume, when you're onboarding with H-1Bs or green cards through the Labor Department, they may look to see what you did when you were on OPT. And it may come up at a later time. So you want to make sure that it's relegated to the field of study. Great. Thank you. Um, so this one is, are CPT applications being processed during this time? If so, how do I apply and how long does the process take? So um, I chatted the answer to that, that the experience office is processing CPTs. They're part of the career services offices. Um, and you can just look for them on the new school website under experience and they will process your OPT with you. Good. Okay, next question, hold on. If my OPT ends in December, can I still file for H-1B before it expires? No, no, if your OPT expires in, in February, you're okay. Remember, there's a 60 day grace period. So if you self-destruct in February, then February gets you over to April and April is when you could apply for H-1Bs for the October start date. If you uh, if you end in December, your 60 day grace period then is in February and the H-1Bs can't be filed till April 1. That's the cap gap timing. Now that's not anything you can control. It depends when you start school and now you probably regret it. What are your options? Make an appointment to talk to somebody to see or consider going back to school or changing or extending your status to a visitor or other visas that I enumerated. Thank you. Um, there is a question about the fall semester. So this webinar is not necessarily going to get into the details of, of what the fall semester could be at the new school. Uh, we do have sessions coming up for hot topics. Um, Anya, can you give us a quick plug on the hot topics dates? Um, sure. We have 
three sessions coming up. One session is on Thursday, April 30th. Uh, the second section, uh, session is on May 5th. It's a session together with Experience Office. And third session is on May 8th. I am going to um, add details with time and Zoom link into chat. What are those hot topics about? So it talks about um, maintaining status. It talks about potential options for the fall semester, uh, OPT, completing OPT, Good. that in travel. There is a recorded session posted on our Instagram. Yeah. Lovely. And then just everyone keep in mind that the fall semester is being discussed with the university. Um, there is no determined exact process and that probably will be determined in the next two weeks. Okay, next question. Um, one second. Okay, so this question is, and there was a few of these. Um, it's a question about the stimulus uh, package that, um, and the question is, is, do I qualify for it? I don't know, Michael, if you want to take a stab at that. We do have some information. We sent it out by email on the 24th to all students regarding uh, an answer to that question. Um, to just give you guys a quick answer, if you didn't see that email, it talks, there's a link to our uh, tax partners who, that are called Sprint Tax. They have a webinar and a recorded session that addresses the stimulus package and what it means as an F1 or J1 student or scholar and the qualifications for the stimulus package. So um, that's- so I, I, Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't get involved because that has to do outside of my, I like to stay in my lane on immigration. No yeah, okay. and I think if you take money and it's insurance, don't sweat it. You have to eat, but move forward onto higher ground. If you have a visa, get a green card, by the way, I want you to know, I've spent so much time now with people who are living with U.S. citizens for four or five years, and they're going through all kinds of crazy contortions, and then I had a heart-to-heart -heart with them about getting married. And it, it wouldn't dawn on them to break up, and they don't want to kill a good thing by getting married, but it's the right solution for them, and the couple's going to go for therapy to figure out if it's a prenuptial agreement, if it's psychological that they don't want to marry. But you really have to do a deep dive and kind of look and pull the lens back in your own landscape. We're all going through something extraordinary right now, and you may have something easy in your own household and not realize it. Thank you. Um, so just to give you a little bit more about the stimulus package, we will have on our FAQs on the ISSS webpage, most likely tomorrow, that information that went out by email will also be on the FAQ page. So just keep a lookout for that. And that has links to the sprint tax information. Uh, the next question is, I need an SSN and the uh, SSA office are closed. Uh, do you have any update on the SSA office might reopen? Unfortunately, we don't have that. So if you're in the need of a social security number, currently um, there is no particular option if you need to apply for one because that is required to go to the social security office in person. Um, I would suggest speaking to your employer or if you're if it's a campus position, then obviously to your campus supervisor about working um, if you don't have a social security number at this point. All right. Um, okay, it says my student visa F1, my student visa expires May 20th, 2020. What can I do? to extend it as I cannot return to my home country. Does the person say what country they're from? It does not. All right, so their time expires May 20th, 2020. He can't retire or he can't return or he doesn't want to return is a big difference. I don't like applying for political asylum without an underlying solution in place where you create a runway long enough so that if ultimately the asylum is denied, they won't place you in removal proceedings, and then you pre, you preemptively applied for asylum because it's not a predicate country to apply for asylum. So what does that mean? If you're from India and you're applying for asylum, it's a very weak case. If you're from Pakistan 
it might be a stronger case, but you have to have a good narrative for it. If you're from Mexico, Spain, or otherwise, these things change uh, remarkably. So if you don't want to go back because you have a fear of going back, then you have to be careful to assess whether or not asylum is the right thing for you. Because if you don't succeed in asylum, it's like, like that last bullet in a gun, the, the weapon is now useless because you can't do anything further if you don't win that case. I like to get a belt and suspenders. I like somebody to apply for another visa. If we want to apply for asylum, we can. If the asylum is, is denied, no big deal. You're here as a student. So if you want to maintain yourself and if you can afford to pay tuition, go for a master's, go for a PhD. You get OPT each time. That should give you enough time to handle an asylum claim or, or come up for it. That's if you can't go back to your country. The question is very obscure. If you don't want to go back for economic reasons, then you have to evaluate what other visas do you have? Can you onboard into the workforce? Are you in a country that would also allow the E-visa? I didn't get into the E-visa. There are a lot of people watching this that we have E-1 uh, or E-2 uh, treaty visas. That there was no slide here. What's an E-visa? Those are countries where you're either involved in trade from your home country or you start your own business. If you put three, 400 grand of your own money and four or five people to work, you'll get yourself an e-visa. It's a wonderful visa. I didn't cover it here because it's unlikely in the constituency of people that are here, but knowing where you come from, and as the commercial for Capital One says, what's in your wallet, I'd like to see whether or not there are things that you can do to lay out an option for yourself. The person just qu uh, clarified the question. They're saying they don't want to go back because of coronavirus, because the borders are oh. shut down. And if it's on lockdown and we are unable to go back, how can Good. we continue to stay without uh, uh, violating their status? Excellent question, and that's to be determined right now. Um, listen, we had what's called TPS, Temporary Protected Status, when there were um, uh, earthquakes uh, in uh, Haiti uh, and um, tsunamis in uh, Japan. The presidents in the past have always given hospitality to nationals who get stuck here. It's kind of what we expect for Americans. And if we don't treat foreign nationals properly, then why would people treat with respect our nationals in other countries? The president has been silent, definitely silent on this. And that's a shame because it sends out a bad message to people like yourself who have talent and may rather not stay here and compete against us. And it hurts our economy in the end. So you have to sit tight. You have to find somebody like me that you trust and wait to see how it evolves. You have to, in the meantime, make sure you maintain your status by going to school, your Zoom classes and so forth, and that you change or extend your status and that you're in touch with somebody competent as well. I am waiting for my OPT and I have already received the approval notice. If I leave the US without the OPT, are there going to be any issues coming back? Yes, you cannot leave without your OPT because you can't come back. In order to come back, you have to have a visa in your passport. Your I-20 has to be executed and you need an OPT in your, in your hand. You're not valid to travel without all three of those. And if it, doesn't, if it hasn't been issued, you're grounded until you get it. Now, we don't know whether or not COVID-19 is going to come back, frankly, in the fall. So if you think you're going to wait and somebody's going to send it to you and you're out, that's not the way to do it. Sit tight here and wait for the document to come. And keep in mind, if, if you end up doing it anyway, then you're risking not getting your EAD card in your hand. That's a big risk. Big risk. And you can't have somebody else get it for you because the mail is now falling apart. And if somebody else doesn't get it or the mailman doesn't see that you're living there or the building loses it, you're, you're nailed and you're not here. If your boots aren't on the ground, you have a diminished uh, ability to sort this out. And once you leave, how are you going to get back? And what country are you coming from? And what's your path? This is the conversation. Again, the acronym HELLO, H-E-L-O, those four main visas. I didn't, I regret not going into the E visa as much, but I'm happy to do that on individual consults. But you need to figure out now, while you're waiting for the OPT, what you're going to do to get to higher ground later. Don't just sit there uh, waiting. You know, my dad's most important client, he represented John Lennon from the Beatles in the 1970s, Google my name, you'll see my father, Leon Wiles. Um, it's the brochure that you saw at the very end of the last slide. 
Um, my dad represented John against the Nixon administration who wanted him out because he influenced voters against the re-election of the president. Out of that case, they discovered a discretionary uh, plan that the government had in removing and then stopping the removal of people, prosecutorial discretion. It was that case, that hook that President Obama 40 years later relied on to give DACA. Can you imagine? Dreamers, DACA is now because of one case that my father handled years ago. So I just want you to understand that these things come back. The government is looking at all times um, to see whether or not they're gonna exercise prosecutorial discretion favorably or disfavorably, and they have a memory of what you do and what you don't do. Can a student with an F1 visa trade stock slash options? Yes, but if it's passive inv in investment, if that's what you're doing, if you have a business card as a trader, if you're online, if you have an email for a company where you're trading, now you're running a business without a visa for it. You're allowed to buy a lottery ticket when you go to a store and you buy a banana, coffee, and a, and a lottery ticket. You're allowed to invest some money. I don't see any problem with that, so long as it's passive and it's not the main way that you're here. We had a client who was sitting in Starbucks on a computer, and he had a vitamin company that he ran outside of the United States, and he was selling vitamins, but he was in Starbucks, and immigration got him. He came to our office, and I said, you're nailed. He goes, why? You were working while you're in America, but my world is in cyberspace, and the company and all the materials are outside. I said, it's too bad. You were working while you're in the United States. You needed a visa here. You were, all you were doing was working all day long in Starbucks, and you didn't have a visa. There's a case called Matter of Hera, another case my father handled in 1962 that tells you what's a proper use of the B1, B2. There, there was a dragnet of about 14 um, Hong Kong tailors that were measuring people in America and having the suits made abroad. And there was a dragnet that arrested all of them. And they explained, and my father won an appeal, that you're permitted to do small things in America so long as the, most of the work is being done abroad. Well, this guy's major job was doing vitamins from a computer in Starbucks. And he was in breach of his B1, B2. Be very sensitive if you're investing in companies that it's just something passive and infrequent. Thank you. All right. Um, if we have been waitlisted for H1B, when should we expect answers if our EAD card expires in May? Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. You faded out. It says, uh, if we have been waitlisted for H-1B, when should we expect answers if our... There's no wait. I don't, I don't understand by waitlisting. There's no yeah, such thing either. as a waitlist. Yeah. This is like, it's like pregnancy. It's either yes or it's not. There's no right. waitlisting. I'm afraid somebody may be taking advantage of you if they say you're waitlisted. They've already told everybody this year they did something very different with the H-1Bs. They had everybody apply for the lottery first, and then they told everyone who won, now you have a few months to go put it together. So there's no wait listing. I'm afraid you'll either know if you were selected or not. Ask the professional that you hired or be in touch with me. Thank you. Is it possible to work for two employers with the TN visa? With two separate TNs, yes. You Our can't use one. You can't use one TN for two different employers. Um, there's one question that I keep on seeing here in the comments. It has to do with OPT. Um, a student is in master's program that is one year long. In order to get an OPT, you need to be on campus for two semesters. What happens if I am, uh, if I do one semester online and one semester on campus? Uh, will I be able to um, uh, have an OPT. That's more in your space. How yeah. would you answer that? So the question, it, it depends on, it, it's hard to answer that because I don't know the scenario. Um, if you are, if this is, if next semester is online and you were active this semester, the next semester would qualify as a full course of study semester and that would count. If next semester is your first semester and it's online, then the semester will not count because your presence in the United States will not 
be required and therefore your I-20 would be pushed for a start date for spring. So the scenario is a good question. We don't really want to get into too many details with that because we don't have an answer of what's happening next semester yet. So I, once I, we do, we will have that scenario available in specifically for you and what that answer will be. Um, I have, um, just to put out if I can, um, our social media, I forgot to do that before. Um, I have two Instagrams and two Facebooks for what it's worth. And I, we put content out all over the place. The Instagram is Wilds Immigration Law. That's W-I-L-D-E-S Immigration Law. And my personal one is my name with middle initial J. So it's Michael J. Wilds. On Facebook, it's Mayor Michael Wilds ESQ. Um, and also a Wilds uh, and Weinberg Immigration Law Office. We're I'm going to add all of this in the comments, okay? Yeah, thank you. I just, just for people to be able to find us, as we get changes, we're posting them in real time also. Okay. Um, I see many, many questions. So I, I'm, again, I apologize. I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them, but we'll do our best here. Um, aren't O1 and O2 visas paused, during, paused due to the coronavirus? No. No way. No, we're getting people in and out all the time. We're getting O visas. The issuance of the visa brought at the American embassy is, but if you're domestically in America and your O visa is running out, you're allowed to apply for visas six months in advance. I, I tickle, that's a tickle list that we have. We tickle a client, you know, eight months before the visa is up that we can file this in two months. Do you want us to work in your extension? I never take a chance on my client. This is, again, not a file. It's your life. If you have an O visa already and you're here, we can file for extension. If you're abroad, we'll file for it. We'll get an approval and then you'll sit there and you look at your watch waiting for the embassy to open. You want to be the first one in. Now, will they approve O visas if you don't have commitments here? It really depends on the narrative and what your company is doing. Are they capable of working? Are they capable of doing things? A lot of people are, are doing O visas to get ready for the big opening because they know they're going to be part of the healing and they have to make up for lost business and they have plans. So we're doing O visas for people starting in September. You're allowed to apply six months in advance. We're, well, we're, we're there. Okay. Um, this question I can just answer real quick. Is USCIS still processing OPT during this time? The answer is yes. They're still processing. And as a matter of fact, they are very quick right now in processing it in about 31 days for OPT applications. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, here's one. And maybe you want to answer this, Michael. Um, I am currently on furlough for my work. I do not have, I, I do, however, have medical insurance. My work is also applying for my H1B and green card. I would like to know if I can, I would like to know if even I can apply for unemployment and if it will affect any way my applications. Right, so we, I discussed that during the presentation. Um, uh, the insurance, it does not seem to have a negative effect on the public charge, but it really begs the question whether or not you can take a job for somebody else under the unemployment. If at all possible, you wanna make sure that the company is actually applying for your H-1B. What does that mean? Were you selected? They should have a frank conversation with you. If you were selected for the H-1B, you have a degree in the field that you're working in, then you're gonna be okay, so long as they continue your employment. Did they actually start the green card case? And if they are, would they get started now? Explain to them that you're worried and you're nervous. So, you know, I understand that you need money and you'd like to get the furlough, but if they're holding the only cards that you have and then they come back to you, sorry, sweetheart, in a month's time, we aren't doing the H-1B, we can't afford the filing fee, we don't want to do it, we're not doing the green card. What did you do between now and that month to get yourself ready? It seems to me that if you're waiting for insurance, if you're hoping the employer is going to do this, you got to get in front of another lawyer to make sure you have a plan B, a plan C, a plan D. Are you going back to school? Are you going to go work abroad? Are you going to do some other... Um, what are you going to do to protect yourself? Because you don't want to depend on employers right now because they are doing what they can, but a lot of them are bleeding. 
Um, I'll answer this next question. This question has to do with uh, a student who is ending their studies and going on to a master's program at the same school, which I assume is us at the new school. But if that's the case, if you're in the US and you're changing to a master's program, then that would allow you to continue your, your uh, F1 status. Um, okay, I figured that was that you were gonna take that? Yeah, I took it, yeah. I was just answering the question that if you're in the US and you're changing levels, then you will get the new I-20 and you're able to remain in the United States. That's right. Um, but you have, to, you have to be careful that you apply at a time when there's actually class to matriculate. And if the new school hasn't decided what they're going to do about next semester, it's a real issue for your constituency. You know, in other words, it's okay if people didn't get here and they're abroad and they know they have to wait a few months to see till this thing passes. What about all the wonderful people that are now here? Right. And what, what is the administration going to do? Are they going to punish all of them because the school didn't open up? The smart thing to do is to give everybody a pass, to give everybody an extension of time. The government has not done that. They have not shown their hospitality. And that's shameful in my opinion, because our, re our citizens stuck in other countries are, are being given greater deference and the world should have been tr drawn together to help one another rather than have people like yourselves worried about your health and your legal life, which is really not in a good, in a good way. So it doesn't depict us well. I happen to think that when the election is over, things are going to change. It's just politics. That's my impression. Yeah. Um, will there be any extensions for individuals on OPT due to the given circumstances? Nothing that I've heard of. There should be, but nothing that I've heard of. Um, I think you should keep extending your B1, B2 if you have the ability to do that, I think that's very smart, very clever. So Michael, how, uh, we're at 5.30 now. Um, you know, we appreciate your time that you've given us. I can keep going if you want me to. Okay. Anya, have you seen any questions that are kind of being repeated? I'm going one by one here. I just wanted to check and see if you see anything that's kind of trending. Um, so the, most of the questions have to do with, um, OPT and the uh, if people so the question that I keep on seeing is if I receive my OPT and go home, uh, am I allowed to come back to the US giving COVID-19 restrictions? Um, provided you have the um, provided you have the um, visa in your passport a valid I-20 and the OPT card in your hand, yes. Thank you. And I, and I shared that, our link to our website about what travelers would need, um, whether you're on OPT, STEM OPT, or regular uh, uh, study status. Um, here's one, um, it says, I've got my visa by an I-20 that I got from ESL program. I am now admitted to the MFA program starting in the fall. I plan to go back to my home country, Iran in the summer. Can I use the same visa for the I-20 to re-enter? So the answer is, as long as your visa is valid, um, then you can travel with that visa, even if you've gotten the new I-20 for the new program. I also see a question about uh, mental health providers and if mental health providers will be facilitated getting green cards, considering that there's a great need for psychological support at the moment. Um, I hear nothing um, about mental health. I see that the government made exceptions to the to the 60 day moratorium for people in the sciences and first responders. Um, but there are fast track cases for certain therapists in the United States. And I think you should be stepping forward to see if there's a way for you to get a status. Um, here's one, Michael. Um, if I get a J-1 visa as a visiting scholar after my, I believe, oh, after my OPT. Thank you. I'm just reading that again. So let me read it again. If I get a J-1 visa as a visiting scholar after my OPT, would I be subject to the two-year home residency rule, even though I would not, I would not be receiving any payments from the university I would be affiliated with in the U.S.? 
I don't see a lot of people that go from F1s to J1s. The J1 has its own science as to whether or not you'll be subject to the two-year foreign residence requirement. That's something you can inquire of the DSO and the institution that you're going to, and you will have to act accordingly. I think it's foolish to bind yourself for a two-year commitment when we don't know how long COVID and a vaccine is going to happen. And it's time to get out of that left side and go towards a work visa and a green card and citizenship. Stay away from the weak. I don't like F1s. You'll forgive me. I don't like j ones I want to get you to the right side. I want you to get to higher ground. I want you to get a visa. I want you to get a green card. I don't want you doing stuff that are more band-aids. It's time to get surgery and stay here permanently and, and, and contribute to this beautiful country. Great. Um, just to reiterate everyone, um, there's, there's been a bunch of questions about applying for OPT. USCIS, as I mentioned, is still open and processing. So um, you still have that chance, you still can apply if you have not. The question is, is if you're outside of the US, can I apply? And the answer to that is you cannot. You need to be in the US to apply for OPT. Um, here's another question, Michael. I'm actually on OPT until July 14th. And would like to apply for a O-1 visa. When would be the best time to apply for the O-1 visa considering also that I am from France and that the borders are closed? Okay, so July 14 gives you 60 day grace period. So you're really good till about September 13. If you're in your young 20s and you're right out of school and you have no experience and you got a couple little things under your belt, it's probably not a very strong O visa. If you have a lot of stuff, I have to evaluate it, my staff and I. Um, and you might want to go to school while we assess your credentials and go for um, a higher level of, of a degree. And then we'll kind of coach you along what you need to do when the world sets itself back on its own feet and you can get some experience outside. We have a lot of students who actually spend time traveling home to France, to Mexico, and they do exhibits and shows and they get involved with work outside of America while they're students. And then the, the things that they credential themselves outside of America are very impressive. Now you may not be able to afford tuition and you may wanna go back home, but if at home is not any better for you than it is here or if the opportunity in the arts and culture have not expanded themselves in Europe, then going home is a waste of time. You really need to do a consult. It's not something I can do in the blind. What I'm missing is your CV your work experience, the journey that you've taken, and the eye candy of the sponsor. I, I want you to know, I tell this to my clients, I had a photographer that was just okay. But when Woody Allen called up and said, I'd like her to be the, um, the, uh, the set photographer in my films, she became an O. It's because of the eye candy of the job offers that you have. Sometimes it excuses everything. And we've done O visas for extraordinary talent if you look online. Um, we know it when we see it, and we also know young talent. And if you are just hand, you know, we'll be brutally honest with you. Now, the other option for this young lady would be apply for an O2, find an O1 in your space, and do something with them in Canada or, or in France, and then hook your wagon to them and build your narrative, and then develop your own stride, and then you can have your own O1. Okay, Anya, I think we'll take two more questions now. If you can um, just look for them, I'm going to ask this one and then we're going to go with two more. But I'm going to leave that for you, Anya, to pick those last two. Um, sure. This question is, if a new student of, obtains a F1 visa, but the semester remains online, can they travel to the U.S. and study remotely from here? If not, what will happen to the, their F1 visa? So. Uh, if you're a new student, and when I say new, I'm assuming that means for the fall semester, and if that semester is determined to be online, then you would not be able to come to the U.S. on the visa because the I-20 would be deferred to the spring, and the spring would be the required study semester. That's in that particular scenario. Um, so that's for a new student who would be coming for the fall semester. So we have a lot of questions uh, about maintaining status. So if students stay here through the summer uh, without taking classes, will that affect their F1 status? Because they cannot go home. 
We, that's to be determined right now. We don't know what's going to happen with this president, and they haven't spoken towards this. Um, I think he deems himself to be weak if he appears to the world to care about students. And it's foolhardy because students become the next CEOs, COOs, CFOs of just about anything that's important in this country. And I think at some point it'll come to a head, not just because the American immigration lawyers will, will advance the subject, but because it'll become clear that multiple industries are dependent on you, whether it's the housing in the New York, the tuitions of schools uh, and, and, and the local economy that supports you. So these are not answered questions, but they will present themselves. And as we get information, I'll make myself available. Thank you. And last question um, is, uh, do you anticipate any new regulation prohibiting students entering the US due to COVID? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, if this thing is a longer haul, I mean, it, it, allow me to kind of extrapolate because I'm, like I said, I'm a mayor and I see other uh, states and, and communities now going back to um, where we were. If that proves to be a mistake or if this COVID comes back, this president, as we get closer to November, is going to use immigration to galvanize his base. He can no longer have people get together in these huge stadiums. So he uses whatever um, soapbox he has. And immigration is one that he likes by default to go to. And it's a shame because it looks that he can do this because Congress is very weak on immigration and they don't have a voice. That's why if you go on YouTube, you'll see I go often on Fox News and I debate them because I don't want them to kind of control the narrative. Every single time some criminal alien does something wrong, they're trying to scare the hell out of America that foreigners are gonna cause you harm and take your jobs. That's not the truth. This country is built on the back of immigrants and we can't scapegoat and create division. And that's what's happening. So I think that there is a strong possibility that something bad can get worse and everybody here has to be prepared. And, you know, what I started to say about John Lennon before was one of our favorite songs in the family is Beautiful Boy. And one of the stanzas that he says to his son, Sean, is life what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Do not become a passenger while you're here in COVID-19 because what's going on could change. And it doesn't mean it's going to change for the better. It could be that things are going to get worse for a while. And what are you going to do? Are you dependent on an employer who gave you a commitment in a different economy? Are you dependent on a school that has yet to decide what they're going to do? Do you have family here? Do you have friends that own companies? Do you have the ambition of leaving maybe and going back and waiting this out and come back at a later time? I don't know. I just know that you need to make sure that you sit with somebody competent and who has a global view and will be practical with you uh, and not general, because these are very trying times. These are historic times. And the question is, when we look at it a few years from now, are we, would we have been better off going back home for the young girl from France who asked the last question? I don't know what's gonna go in France. If it's worse there, or she's not gonna be able to help herself in an economy, extend her credentials, she's better off being in school. Right now is the best time to be in school, frankly because you wanna sit this out. You wanna see how the economy reconstitutes, how America steps up into its responsibility to deal and protect the citizens and be an example to the nations. And if they don't and they start pushing your buttons, then this may not be the right time for you to be here because frankly speaking, um, you, it's a two-way street and your trust needs to be earned and appreciated. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us today. My um, pleasure. I posted the links to your Facebook uh, profiles and to your Instagram profiles in the comments. The session is also recorded and we will be posting it on Instagram. Um, and uh, Michael's email is also in the comments. Um, you can see it there. So please, if you have any questions, 
uh, and want to contact Michael, his email is michael at wildslaw.com. I also um, am happy if you'd like me to do uh, an O visa workshop now so people can kind of get used to, you know, it's like exercise, you know, developing the muscle, understanding the, the you know, also the onboarding into the workforce, questions that can be asked of you, how to answer them. I have an H-1B workshop that I do. Use your judgment so people can plan and get dexterous and flexible with these visas. But I caution everybody to find somebody, first of all, you can afford and somebody uh, who is respectable. I've never turned down somebody because of money. I just want you to know. We have uh, a home, my mother, rest her soul, who put more water in the soup so we'd have more guests, more people to eat, more relationships to develop. And it's in that spirit that I'm here today. I wish everybody safety, much love and success, and thank you for investing in America. I still believe, despite the politics, you're going to do handsomely, just need to focus. Thank you so much, and I just want to let you know that there are a lot of comments uh, from students who would love to have a no visa workshop. Good. And they're also thanking, thanking you for this webinar and saying thank that you. it's been very helpful. So thank so, you so oh, much. Thank you. All those sessions that you have, let me know and I'll schedule them in. And I'll come up with new content and I'll explain the e-visa, a few other things if I need to as well. But thank you for your trust. Thank you so much for your time. Have a good evening, everybody, and stay safe.